Welcome to my course on genome editing and engineering. Today we are going to have a lecture on the introduction of genes and genome organization. Let us start with the work of Mendel who is considered as the father of genetics. Mendel through his breeding experiments with P proposed that there were two factors for each basic trait and that one factor was inherited from each parent. These inheritable factors are what we know today as genes. On February 8, 19, 1865, Mendel presented his work to the Brun Society for Nursal Science and the next year his paper Experiments on Plant Hybridization was published but was forgotten by the scientific community until rediscovered by De Vries, Correns and Semark independently in 1900. Mendel died without his work being recognized, but he had the confidence that people will understand the value of his work in future. The term gene was however coined much later in the early 20th century by the Danish botanist Wilhelm Ludwig Johansson in 1909. Rapidly became fundamental to the then new science of genetics, and Mendel's factors were started to be called the genes. Interestingly, Johansson also introduced the concept of uh, phenotype and uh, genotype. The origin of the word gene is in the Greek word gen, uh, which means to create or creation of birth. The National Cancer Institute defines gene as follows. Gene is a basic unit of heredity passed from parent to child. Genes are made up of the sequences of DNA and are arranged one after another at specific locations on chromosomes in the nucleus of cells. They contain information for making specific proteins that lead to the expression of a particular physical characteristics or trait such as hair color or eye color or to a particular function uh, in a cell. Another term that is associated with heredity and genes is genome. What is genome? The term genome was introduced in 1920 by the German botanist Hans Winkler to describe the haploid chromosome set which together with the pertinent protoplasm specifies the material foundations of the species. We humans are deployed in nature. The half set of the diploid chromosomes are what we call as the haploid uh, chromosome set. This genome is the complete set of genetic information in an organism. It provides all of the information the organism requires to function. In living organisms, the genome is stored in long molecules of DNA and we call them as chromosomes. In eukaryotes, each cell's genome is contained within a membrane bound structure called the nucleus. However, the prokaryotes which do not contain any inner membranes, they store their genome in region of the cytoplasm called as the nucleoid. With so many advances since the days of Mendel, how much do we actually know about the gene? Although there have been many discoveries, inventions and advances in the understanding of the gene, we still have many things unexplored regarding the nature of the gene. And this paper by Peter Portin Adam Wilkins deals with an interesting topic, the evolving definition of the term gene. So our concept of the gene has been changing from time immemorial and for this region, Portin and Wilkins provided a provisional definition of gene. According to them, a gene is a DNA sequence whose component segments do not necessarily 
need to be physically contiguous. This is very, very uh, important point. The genes may be split, they may, a single gene may not stay together as a piece of information. This information can remain in various space and it specifies one or more sequence related RNAs or proteins that are both evoked by genetic regulatory networks and participate as elements in GRNs often with indirect effects or as outputs of GRNs, the latter yielding more direct phenotypic effect. Let us now discuss about some of the important scientific developments in the field of genetics. Let us discuss about first the work of Frederick Griffith who studied two different strains of a bacterium, a non-virulent strain and a virulent strain. The non-virulent strain called the R strain or the RAF strain uh, did not cause any disease while the virulent strain called the S strain causes disease in mice. So when injected into mice, the S strain killed the mice, but the R strain did not kill the mice. This was a very simple experiment, but very interesting. Later on, he injected mice with heat kill S strain bacteria. Since the virulent strain S is now heat killed, as expected, it could not cause disease and kill the mice. So, the mice was alive at the end of the experiment. What he did after this was something very, very innovative. He injected the mice with heat kill S strain bacteria, which cannot kill the mice. But then along with it, he mixed the live R strain bacteria, which is harmless. So, both things were supposed to save the mice, not kill it, but the result was something very, very interesting. The mice got killed. So, there must be something in the heat kill S strain, which transforms the R strain into a killer strain. That was the observation by Frederick Griffith and he named this as the transforming principle. This interesting work led to many other scientists to verify what this transforming principle uh, is, what is its nature. So, in 1944, Avery, MacLeod and McCarthy identified that DNA is the transforming principle as postulated by Griffith and they established this with the study of streptococcus pneumoniae that causes bacteria. In this picture, you can see Macklin McCarthy with Francis Creek and James D. Watson about whom we will discuss in the next few slides. This was followed by other interesting experiments. For example, uh, the experiments by Hersey and Says uh, called the wearing blender experiment provided the concrete evidence that genes were made up of DNA. For this work in 1969, Hersey shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Max Delbruck and Luria for their discoveries concerning the genetic structure of viruses. Now, if you look into this uh, diagram, you can see the work carried out by Hersey and Says. So, in step 1, they labeled the DNA with uh, 32P and another batch was labeled with 32S. So, 32P uh, labels the DNA while 35 S sulfur labels the uh, protein coat. So, one batch of the phase was labeled with 32 P which is incorporated into the DNA while another batch of phase was labeled with 32 S 
which is incorporated into the protein coat. Next, the bacteria were infected with the labeled phage and they look to identify if the viral DNA or viral protein enters the host cell. The cultures were blended and centrifuged to separate the fuzz from the bacteria. The centrifuge separated the lighter fuzz particles from the heavier bacterial cells as you can see in this picture. The bacteria infected with fuzz containing 32 p labeled DNA produced 32 p labeled fudge while the bacteria infected with 35 s level fudge produced unlabeled fast which means that DNA is the material that was inherited into the next progeny and not protein. So, these firmly established that the genes are made up of DNA. It was much later uh, Levin came into the picture and he put forward a famous model called the polynucleotide model and he in fact uh, told uh, with high confidence that new facts and new evidence may cause its alteration, but there is no doubt as, as to the polynucleotide structure of the yeast nucleic acid. Fabus Levin was a Russian biochemist who proposed that nucleic acids were composed of a series of nucleotides and that each nucleotide was in turn composed of just one of four nitrogen containing bases, a sugar molecule and a phosphate group. In fact, he was the first to discover the order of the three main components of a single nucleotide and to discover the carbohydrate component of RNA. Another of his work and hypothesis known as the tetranucleotide hypothesis however turned out to be wrong where he stated that DNA was made up of equal amounts of adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. It is important to know about the tetranucleotide hypothesis at this stage because soon we will know the exact composition of a DNA molecule by the work of Arvind Sargaff. Arvind Sargaff was an Austrian biochemist who followed the work of every McCarthy and McLeod and he demonstrated that hereditary units or genes are composed of DNA. He expanded on Levin's work by uncovering additional details of the structure of DNA which further paved the way for Watson and Crick model. The two main discoveries done by Sargaff are 1 in any double stranded DNA the number of guanine units equals the number of cytosine units and the number of adenine units equals the number of thymine units and the composition of DNA varies from one species to another. Sargaff's work provided the firm evidence to disprove the prevailing tetranucleotide hypothesis by Levin which we discussed prior to this slide. Now, what is the Sargaff's rule? As you can see here on the left side are the purines and on the right side are the pyrimidines and from the figure you can see purines A is equal to T and G is equal to C. So, Sargaff's rules is quite simple which states that the total number of purines in a DNA molecule is equal to the total number of pyrimidines. This is one of the fundamental uh, principles we have to remember whenever we study about the structure and function of a DNA molecule. Let us now focus on the work by Rosanil Franklin and others. Uh, John, James Watson, Francis Creek, uh, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin they all played a critical role in discovering the structure of uh, DNA. So, this is one of the most famous photographs in molecular biology. This is an exit diffraction photo of DNA which was taken by Wilkins and Franklin 
And this served as a key line of evidence in figuring out the structure of DNA. You can see here the accepted pattern in the image which strongly suggested a helical form and other details of the structure. This picture of DNA was uh, taken by uh, Rosalind Franklin. Let us discuss about the Watson and Crick model based on the X-ray photo taken by Rosalind and Will Greens. According to Watson and Crick model, deoxyribonucleic acid is a double stranded helical molecule consisting of two sugar phosphate backbones on the outside which are held together by hydrogen bones between pairs of nitrogenous bases on the inside. The bases are of four types adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine. Pairing occurs always between adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. Does either strand contain all the information necessary to make a new copy of the entire molecule and they figured out that the aperiodic order of the bases might provide a genetic code which took a couple of years to uh, be proven. Now what is this genetic code? The genetic code is a set of rules defining how the four letter code of DNA is translated into the 20 letter code of amino acids which are the building blocks of proteins. The genetic code is a set of three letter combinations of nucleotides which we call as codons, each of which correspond to a specific amino acid or a stop signal. As already mentioned earlier, the concept of codons was first described by Creek and his colleagues in 1961. Around the same time, Marcel Nirenberg and Heinrich Mattei performed experiments for deciphering the genetic code. They found out that the RNA sequence UUU specifically coded for the amino acid phenylalanine and soon afterwards, Nirenberg, Philip Leder and Hargobin Khurana identified the rest of the genetic code and fully described each three letter codon and its corresponding amino acid. The 64 possible permutations or combinations of a three letter nucleotide sequence can be made from the four nucleotides and you can see in this diagram, circular diagram, if you for example, the first letter is G followed by A then G, it will give represent glutamic acid. Again, if the first letter is Z, second letter is A and the third letter is A, that will also represent glutamic acid, which means there is some kind of redundancy in the codon dictionary. This is very, very important to understand that one amino acid may have more than one codon. For example, here threonine can have one, two, three, uh, four different kind of codons. But what is interesting to observe over here, the first letter would be always A, second letter would be always C, but the third letter there is a variation, almost all the four uh, bases are present over there. So, this is the redundancy in the codon dictionary. Now, there are other codons which do not represent any amino acids. For example, if the first letter is Z, second oh, sorry, the first letter is U, second letter is Z and the third letter is A, it will signal a stop signal or a stop codon, it do not represent any kind of an amino acid. Similarly, uh, UAA 
also represents a stop codon or a null codon which do not represent any amino acids. Now for this work uh, on the genetic code, uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1988, 1968 to uh, Nirenberg, Hargobin Khurana and Holly uh, for their independent establishment of this codon dictionary. With these basic ideas about the genetic material, now let us try to understand how this genetic material is organized inside a living cell. So we discuss about the genome organization now. The DNA of prokaryotes is much more compact as it contains much less non-coding DNA in and between genes compared to eukaryotes. It need to be mentioned over here that higher organisms have very large genomes but only a fraction of this genome code for proteins or RNA or TNA which means only a fraction of these proteins contain codons or sequences for tRNAs, RNAs. The remaining uh, large majority of the sequences are known as junk DNA and earlier they were thought to be of no use but over the years it has been found out the junk DNA are equally important for the function and health of the organism. So in prokaryotes the genes are contiguous and they are transcribed together in one mRNA. A group of such genes are called as operons. In eukaryotes a majority of the DNA does not code for the protein as already discussed and this was known as junk DNA and recently many functions have started emerging and many of these play regulatory role. Eukaryotes do not have any operons. Each eukaryotic gene is transcribed separately into its own mRNA. The nuclear genome contains the major hereditary material of the cell and resides in the nucleus. This is uh, what happens in case of eukaryotes. The nucleus serves as the cell's information uh, processing center and it controls the various activities of the cell such as proliferation, homeostasis and division. In addition to these, eukaryotic cells have other compartments where the genetic information is stored and these are the mitochondrial DNA and the chloroplast DNA. They constitute the mitochondrial and chloroplast genome respectively and these are additional hereditary materials of the cell and as I already told you they reside in the mitochondria and the chloroplast respectively. It need to be mentioned that chloroplasts are available uh, in plants only. So uh, organisms like humans have two important genomes, one is the nuclear genome and the other is the mitochondrial genome. While, while plants have three important genomes, the first one is the nuclear genome, second one is the mitochondrial genome and third one is the chloroplast genome. The mitochondrial genome and the chloroplast genome are very small compared to the nuclear genome, but they are very, very critical for the survival of the organisms. The mitochondria is considered the powerhouse of all organisms. Without it, the organism cannot survive. Similarly, the chloroplast fix carbon dioxide and synthesize sugar by harvesting solar energy. Without the presence of the chloroplast genome, this whole creation 
actually will fall down. So, in spite of their very tiny size, they are very, very critical in the survival of the organism and in fact the entire ecosystem. Now, if you look into the human mitochondrial genome, it contains roughly around 16,500 nucleotides and it encodes 2 ribosomal RNAs, 22 transfer RNAs and 13 different polypeptide chains. This is the map of a mitochondrial genome of Anteria assamensis as you can see on the left side and this contains around 15,272 nucleotides and it encodes similar number of ribosomal RNAs, transfer RNAs and uh, various uh, polypeptide chains. If you look into the right side, we can see the chloroplast DNA of uh, Nicochenia uh, tabacum, which contains around uh, 155.939 uh, base pairs. So, these palm chloroplast genomes are about 10 times larger and contains about 120 genes. How the complete set of genetic material exists inside the cell of an organism is the next topic that we are going to discuss. We now know the genome is not kept in one place, the larger part of the genome is kept in the nucleus, while there are smaller parts which may be kept in mitochondria and another organelle called as the chloroplast. Now, how these material exist uh, for example, in the nucleus? In both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the DNA molecules are highly condensed with the aid of different proteins. In eukaryotes, the DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones. In prokaryotes, the place of histones is taken up by Hue proteins in a similar fashion. These are the two important papers uh, regarding the nuclear division as observed in live bacteria by a new technique by Mashon and Pavelson and another paper uh, by John Cairns which spoke about the bacterial chromosome and its manner of replication as seen by autoradiography. Both these groups used phase contrast microscopy and autoradiography to show that the essential genes of Ascherisia coli are encoded on a single circular chromosome packaged within the cell nucleoid. During a short break in 1957 at the California Institute of Technology, John Keynes proved how Ascherisia coli replicates its uh, DNA. Later he spent another year in Hersey's lab at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where he developed the procedure to visualize the individual radioactive DNA molecules of T2 fast genomes using auto radiography. This is the bacterial chromosome uh, as observed by John Cairns and it is one of the very famous photographs in uh, biology. His work in the two laboratories helped him to capture an image of an actively replicating E. coli chromosome. As you can see, these developments helped Cairns to capture an image of an actively replicating E. coli chromosome. He discovered that the E. coli genome is uh, circular. His work produced one of the most famous images in biology from which, uh, which he termed the coin, uh, coined the term replication fork for the y sepid junctions viewed in this partially replicated genome. Later on, Kainz also showed that human cells managed to replicate their enormous genome in a period of just a few hours by each chromosomes having dozens of replication forks simultaneously copying the DNA. 
So, this is the famous Y fork as you can see over here in this image. Overall, Cairns findings can be summarized as follows. Number 1, the chromosome of E. coli consists of a single piece of two stranded DNA which are 700 to 900 microns long. Number 2, this DNA duplicates by forming a fork. The new daughter limbs of the fork each contain one strand of new material and one strand of the old DNA material. Thirdly, each chromosome length of DNA is probably duplicated by one fork. Thus, when the bacterial generation time is 30 minutes, 20 to 30 microns of DNA is duplicated each minute. Lastly, the chromosome appears to exist as a circle which usually breaks during extraction. Now, let us compare the various features between prokaryotic chromosomes and eukaryotic chromosomes. Many prokaryotes contain a single circular chromosome, while eukaryotes contain multiple linear chromosomes. Prokaryotic chromosomes are condensed in the nucleoid via DNA supercoiling and the binding of various architectural proteins. Eukaryotic chromosomes are condensed in a membrane bound nucleus via histones. Because prokaryotic DNA can interact with the cytoplasm, transcription and translation occur simultaneously. How in eukaryotes this cannot happen? The transcription occurs in the nucleus and the translation occurs in the cytoplasm. Most prokaryotes contain only one copy of its gene that is their haploid, but most eukaryotes contain two copies of its gene that is they are diploid. Non-essential prokaryotic genes are commonly encoded on extra chromosomal plasmids. Some eukaryotic genomes are organized into operons, but most are not. Prokaryotic genomes are efficient and compact containing little repetitive DNA. Extra chromosomal plasmids are not commonly present in eukaryotes and eukaryotes contain large amounts of non-coding and repetitive DNA. Let us now look into the chromosome of the prokaryotic organism Ascaricia coli. The Ascaricia coli chromosome is 4.6 megabases long. It is circular in shape and contains a single origin of replication. The arrows represent the bidirectional replication of DNA. The genetic position of the origin of bidirectional DNA replication ORIC and the site of chromosome decatenation diff in this replication termination region TAR are shown in this figure. These colors represent specific segment of DNA. There are six special domains which have been identified in E. coli. The four domains ORI, TAR, left and right are structured and the two NS right and NS left are non-structured. So, these are some of the important features of the E. coli uh, chromosome. For long, linear plasmids and chromosomes were unknown in prokaryotes and it was believed that all their genetic material are arranged in a circular uh, chromosome. But later on it was found in spirochetes, gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria that plasmids 
could be linear as well. Two structural types of bacterial linear DNA has been characterized. The linear plasmids of the spirochete Borrelia have a covalently closed hairpin loop at each end and a linear plasmid of the gram positive filamentous streptomyces have a covalently attached protein at each end. The chromosome of Borrelia exists as a eukaryotic linear chromosome with a size of around 1000 kb. Its genomes also comprised of several circular and linear plasmids which varied in size from 15 to 1600 kb. So, this is the map or of the total genome of Borrelia. You can see here a linear chromosome which is around 0.91 MB. Then you can see several other uh, linear plasmids over here with uh, variable sizes. And then apart from these, it also contains some circular small uh, genomes. So, overall the total genome of Borrelia is very, very interesting having linear plasmids, a, a linear chromosome and a circular plasmid. Similarly, the common features of linear plasmid of streptomyces are it has a covalently attached protein called terminal protein and there are terminal inverted repeats. Now, let us go into the features of the E. coli chromosome once more. The E. coli chromosome is several orders of magnitude larger than the cell itself. You can see here in this figure the shape of a uh, E. coli and here is the scale and you can make some comparison over uh, here the length and breadth of this particular organism. Now, into this small uh, sized uh, E. coli, a 4.6 MB long E. coli chromosome must be compacted and packaged. So, this is done by compacting it at least 1000 fold to fit inside the bacterial cell. The circular chromosome of E. coli is organized into independently supercoil loop or topological domains in order to fit into this small sized organism. Next, we are going to discuss about this organization of supercoil loops and topological domains. So, you can see here on the left side the single DNA topological domain. Here the chromosomal DNA within the nucleoid is segregated into independent supercoiled topological domains. And you can see from this illustration of a single topological domain of a supercoiled DNA, a single double stranded cut anywhere would be sufficient to relax the supercoiling tension of the entire domain and transform it into a open structure like this. However, in figure B, we can see the multiple DNA topological domains and the difference between the two figures is actually uh, in the presence of certain factors which are colored green over here as you can see which are absent in figure A. We will discuss what these green elements are. So, this is an illustration of multiple topological domain in a supercoiled DNA molecule. Here the presence of supercoiling diffusion barriers segregates a supercoiled DNA molecule into multiple topological domains unlike in the first case. Hypothetical supercoiling diffusion barriers are represented as the green spheres which we are speaking of. Here a single double stranded cut will only relax one topological domain and not the others. So, here due to this cut 
we get only relaxation in one particular domain. So, if there would be a cut in the next domain here, we will have another relaxation over here and similarly another over here if there is a cut in the third topological domain. So, I think this discussion makes clear the various multiple DNA topological domains and the supercoiling diffusion barriers offered by the green spheres in these uh, structures. E. coli HEU protein is a small basic heat stable DNA binding protein and is one of the most abundant proteins associated with the uh, E. coli nucleoid. HU binds to double stranded DNA irrespective of any particular sequence, it is not a sequence specific binder and it exhibits high affinity of abnormal DNA structures such as four way junctions, gaps or nicks that are generated for example, during DNA damage. Who appears to be an important protein for DNA compaction, replication, transcription, recombination and set modulation in many bacteria. The DNA in E. coli is supercoiling curved and we have seen this in our earlier discussion. This result in the placement of certain DNA sequences at the apical tips of supercoils. Depending on the shape, the supercoils can be of two types, plectonemic and toroidal. Uh, they are present in equal amounts. In toroidal supercoils, the DNA is wrapped around proteins and it is restrained transient in bacteria, but permanent in the form of stable nucleosomes in eukaryotes. Plectonomic supercoils which are unrestrained are under torsional stress which can be relieved by formation of a bubble in the DNA helix. Plectonomic supercoils of DNA within the E. coli nucleoid are organized into several topological domains. The ratio between plectonomic and toroidal uh, supercoiling might vary along the chromosomes and also with time, although uh, this may be ideally present in equal amounts. Uh, for example, an RNA polymerase can wrap DNA around it, a restrained toroidal supercoil and then release the DNA later creating an unrestrained uh, supercoil. So, in figure A we can see the circular E. coli genome and we studied about its uh, origin of replication and then the termination sequence, the left right NSLN and LSR elements. So, this entire chromosome get transformed into a random coil structure. So, the formation of these E. coli nucleoid takes place in a stepwise manner. So, in B we can see a random coil form adopted by the pure circular DNA of E. coli at thermal equilibrium without supercoils and additional stabilizing factors. In C and you can see here the position of OREC here and the diff sequence over here. This random coil volume is roughly around 523 cubic microns mere micrometers. So, in figure C we see the genome organization in vivo. This is exactly how the genome is organized inside the E. coli cell. This circular chromosome in A finally organized into a typical structure as shown in figure C. So, in C we can see the chromosome of a newly born 
equally cell the gna genomic dna is not only condensed by 1000 fold compared to its pure random coil but it is also specially organized so there are two things happening here a 1000 fold condensation and a special organization that is the arrangement of these in space and here also you can see that orc and diff are localized in the mid cell and specific regions of the dna indicated by the colors in a for example this is the right turn red that is located in the right extreme and the left turn uh, left sequences represented by blue are present in the left extreme the position of the six spatial domains four structured and two non structured is is easily noticeable over here the condensed and organized form of the dna together with its associated proteins and rna is called as the nucleoid so this is the nucleoid and uh, these are the nsl here and this is the nsr here so this is how the sp six special domains in a uh, e coli chromosome are finally getting arranged in the nucleoid and you can see over here uh, the reduction in the volume from random coil which was around roughly 523 uh, cubic uh, microns to less than 1 micron. So, this is a thousand fold uh, condensation and, and, and quite a an remarkable arrangement. The advances in microscopy and DNA sequencing based technologies especially the chromosome conformation capture derived high throughput genomic methods for mapping chromatin interactions have provided us new insights in the chromatin following principles the organizational features and the structure function relationship of the 3D genome. Chromosomes are composed of DNA tightly wound around histones. So, let us now see the structure of the uh, uh, eukaryotic uh, chromosomes. So, you can see here uh, starting from uh, the histone uh, proteins into which the DNA gets wrapped and then these uh, are uh, condensed into the next level of structure. So, here you can see these DNA and this gene which is tightly wrapped in histone and also packed is inaccessible and this makes the gene inactive. The gene is active only when it is exposed and as in this uh, particular case. So, here DNA methylation and chemical modification of the histone tails after the alter the spacing of nucleosome and change the uh, gene expression. Now, these histone proteins around which DNA winds up compaction and gene regulation uh, are a, a kind of a hurdle when you want to express certain gene. So, the regulatory mechanism in DNA unwinding helps us in gene expression. So, those are uh, important points to be noted that as the genome gets organized and tightly packaged, uh, the gene expression becomes difficult. It is very, very interesting how the cell manages to express its genes in spite of the uh, highly organized uh, chromosome, uh, chromosomal structural elements. So, uh, this small discussion probably gives you some idea how in spite of this packaging uh, the gene expression is possible. So, chromosomal DNA is packaged inside 
the microscopic nuclei with the help of histones. This is one thing we have to remember all the time. The histones are positively charged proteins that bind strongly to negatively charged DNA and form complexes called uh, nucleosomes. Each nucleosome is composed of DNA which is wrapped or wound 1.6 times around a histone uh, octomer. The chromosomes are composed of DNA tightly wound around histones. Chromosomes fold up to form a 30 nanometer uh, chromatin fiber which forms loops averaging 300 nanometers in length. The 300 nanometer fibers are compressed and folded to produce a 250 nanometer wide fiber which is tightly coiled into the chromatid of a uh, chromosome. In this figure you can see various other important features. Uh, for example, you can see this big chromosome which is constituted by chromatins and these chromatins are made up of DNA which are wound around uh, histone uh, proteins and this is in brief the hierarchical structure of uh, genes and uh, chromosomes. The hierarchical organization of the eukaryotic genome uh, critically impacts as I have already discussed various nuclear activities such as transcription and replication and you now know why that is due to the high order of packaging. It also impacts cellular and developmental events such as cell cycle, cell fate decision and embryonic development. These chromosomes contain highly condensed uh, DNA. Chromosomes contain highly condensed uh, DNA. Eukaryotic DNA is elaborately packaged into chromosomes. For example, human chromosome 22 contains about 48 million nucleotide pairs. If you open it out from end to end, its DNA would be about 1.5 centimeter in length. However, when it exists as a mitotic chromosome, chromosome 22 measures only about uh, 2 microns in length. This gives an end to end compaction ratio of nearly 10,000 fold. The DNA of interface chromosomes are less condensed than mitotic chromosomes and it has an overall compaction ratio of approximately uh, 1000 fold. This high condensation is performed by specialized proteins that make the compression possible. Such proteins successively coil and fold the DNA into higher and higher levels of organization. We have to understand that the chromosome structure is not static, it is dynamic. Chromosomes globally condense in accord with the phases of the cell cycle. Different regions of the interface chromosomes condense and decondense as the cells gain access to specific DNA sequences for gene expression, DNA repair and replication. The packaging of chromosomes are accomplished in a way which allows rapid localization on demand access to the DNA for carrying out functions. Without this flexibility, the organism will be as good as dead. For this DNA condensation and packaging, we have to know that these proteins must be having some kind of DNA binding properties. DNA binding proteins that help in forming eukaryotic chromosomes are of two types. The first one are the histones and the second one are the non-histone chromosomal proteins. The complex of both histone and non-histone proteins with the nuclear DNA of eukaryotic cells is known as a chromatin. A chromatin mass is made up of equal amount of DNA and histones. The histones were discovered by Albrecht Cossel in as early as 1884. 
They play a critical role in regulating cellular events such as DNA transcription, replication and repair. Albert Kossel was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1910 for his work in determining the chemical composition of uh, nucleic acids. These histones are basic proteins as already told they have positive charges which allow them to associate with DNA which is negatively charged. This picture on the left is of some traits wrapped on bobbins and many of you may have seen it. So, this would help us in understanding the arrangement of DNA on histone proteins. The histone DNA interfaces are mediated by extensive direct and water mediated hydrogen bonds, ionic interactions, nonpolar contacts and the alignment of helix dipoles relative to phosphor phosphate backbone ions. Few histones functions as pools for the DNA to wrap around similar to these traits on bobins. Histones are present in abundant quantities in the cell and form the first and most basic levels of chromosome organization, the nucleosome. The nucleosome is the fundamental subunit of chromatin and has a diameter of approximately 11 nanometers. A nucleosome is composed of a little less than 2 turns of DNA wrapped around a set of 8 histone proteins called as a histone octamer. So, basically the DNA structure is a string on beads and not a bead on string. The chain of nucleosome is then compacted further and forms a highly organized complex DNA and protein called as chromosomes. Let us examine the hierarchical organization of the genome. Eukaryotic genomic DNA have multiple levels of organization. The 2 meter length of DNA in a mammalian cell is organized into chromosomes which are packaged and folded through various mechanisms and occupy discrete positions in the nucleus. The primary structure of the genome refers to the linear genomic uh, sequences which harbors the information of DNA mod modification example DNA methylation and genomic distribution of the various types of genes. The secondary structure refers to the nucleosome organization of chromatin. The nucleosomes are the basic unit of chromatin and elicit about seven fold linear compaction of genomic DNA. Secondary structures provide a framework for further assembling the genomic DNA into the chromatin fiber and higher order structures as well as a diversity of regulatory mechanisms for genome functions such as nucleosome positioning, histone modifications and chromatin assembly. So, here you can see in the pictorial representation the various levels of organization of the eukaryotic chromosome. You have a DNA double helix structure over here. This DNA wraps around the histones and the histone core here which is around 1.65 turns. Further these nucleosomes are coiled into a chromatin fiber and results in the next level of the structure. These are further condensed and they form the chromatin and finally they gives rise to the large uh, chromosomes. The biochemical and microscopic evidences have revealed that the nucleus is not geometrically homogeneous but rather highly compartmentalized. We need to remember this to understand the next higher level of genome organization. So, the nucleus is highly compartmentalized. This compartmentalization allows various nucleic activities, nuclear activities to be organized into discrete functionally specialized subcellular structures 
called nuclear bodies. The nucleus which assembles around the RDNA, the nucleolus which assembles around the RDNA genes is the largest nuclear body and the primary site of rRNA biogenesis and assembly of ribosomes. There are other types of nuclear bodies like Kajal body, clastosome, nuclear speckle, paraspeckle, nucleus amps, PML body, histone locus body and polycomb body and each of them have special activities uh, inside them. We are not going to discuss those in uh, large detail over here. But what we need to understand is that important nuclear activities like transcription and replication are also organized in discrete nuclear foci in mammalian nuclei and these are termed as transcription and replication factories uh, respectively. The nuclear compartments near the nucleoli and nuclear envelope except the nuclear pores provide a transcriptionally silent microenvironment for heterochromatic regions to reside which is critical for maintaining the genome uh, integrity. The various higher order chromatin organization include uh, chromatin loops, A and B compartments, topologically associated associating uh, domains and chromosome uh, territories. These vary among cells, tissues and species depending on the developmental stage and or environmental conditions. That is are the structural units of the chromatin. The A and B compartments are associated with active and inactive chromatin. The active chromatin are the eukaryotic chromatin and the inactive chromatin are the heterochromatic chromatin and they have well defined genomic and epigenomic uh, features. We need to understand that the nucleus is highly compartmentalized and each chromosome occupies a separate territory in the interface nucleus and forms the topmost layer of hierarchical structure in most of the eukaryotes. So, you can see here the chromosome territories within the nucleus and each chromosome uh, occupies a particular space and they are colored accordingly the green uh, represents green colors represent some chromosomes yellow and blue and so on. So, they are not uh, organized in a random way they are always arranged and positioned in a particular place in the uh, nucleus. The specific nuclear spaces within an interface diploid eukaryotic nucleus occupied by chromosomes are called as nuclear territories. In the way uh, certain animals in the jungles have defined territories chromosomes also have defined territories inside the nucleus. We need to remember this for our next level of uh, discussion. Each chromosome is subdivided into topological associated domains that is with repressed transcriptional activity tend to be associated with the nuclear lamina. This is the nuclear lamina and these stats which are repressed for their transcriptional activity prefer to stay near to this nuclear lamina. While the active TED tend to reside more into the nuclear interior. So, these are the active TEDs and these are not near the nuclear lamina, they are more into the nuclear interior spaces. Each TED is flanked by regions having low interaction frequencies as determined by high C and these are called as TED boundaries and you can see these in the purple hexagons. 
In figure C, we can see the example of an active TED with several interactions between distal regulatory elements and genes within it. So, these are the regulatory elements and, and these are the genes and these are the TED boundaries uh, we had discussed prior to this. So, with this we come to end of our lecture. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.